I think we should uh, throw the confetti in the air and and uh, we're we're going to talk about education and design. Um, you know, one of the things, and when we first spoke about this, one of the things we were talking about was, you know, what is the relevance of of the design institution as a place? Is school a physical place, or is it more a state of mind, or is it something you you just do all your life? And uh, um, you know, I I think we we both have some thoughts on that. So mm -hmm. I wanted to hand that over to you. Sure. I mean, it, in a way, I would say it's all of the above. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to the different ways that one takes in learning around design. And uh, it, it's hard to design in the absence of community or place. Um, does it have to be in a design school setting? Sometimes. I think the advantage of being on site is the learning that happens from peers. And it's not the kind of presentation learning, which can be done virtually very easily. But it's more the sense of discovery that happens all the time when students are working on sometimes the same brief or sometimes independent briefs. But the, the process of building an idea through design is so complex and um, so much about going into territories of the unknown that seeing peers around one can be incredibly inspiring and a great uh, part of a learning environment. And at RISD where, you know, where I am, have been for many years, we really believe in, in a hands-on learning environment. We believe in the importance of the studio and working with real materials. Even if one is only doing that to build a conceptual frame, there's a kind of learning that happens in real scale with real materials, hands-on, that is a highly intellectual kind of learning that is very difficult to do any other way. And most people don't have access to the kind of facilities that they will be able to learn from in a design school environment. Yeah. But I, I, I do is, think, so yeah. I would just say, sorry, one more thing that the pandemic has taught us also new, uh, f new tools for collaboration and for using the virtual technology um, tools that we have available to us to do things that we didn't know how to do before. So uh, that's why I say it's kind of all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's what I was. That's what I wanted to add. Really, is uh, because you know I, I always say design is a contact sport. You know, and it's mm -hmm. much more difficult to work with colleagues now than it was before. Even though we're better off having technology than not having it, that's for sure. But it's not as good as it was, and it's not as quick as it was. And you know, I think there's a bit of magic that gets lost when there's you know something in the room, right? It's it's intangible, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, so in terms of education as well, you know, education in the workplace is, is equally valid because we're constantly learning from each other in the workplace. You know, the, the, younger, the younger team, part of the team is learning from, from, from me and I'm learning from them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, um, I think, getting lost a little bit to some extent. Um, but, you know, what, what I wanted is, um, you know, into in this idea of community and, and that, that has a lot of meaning a lot of connotation. I mean, community of, of work and learning, but also community in the wider sense. And, you know, the, the concern I have is with, um, with the virtual interactions that we're having now, there's less of the real interaction where we can actually be like in a kind of, uh, you know, natural way, be together where we can see and hear each other. And, and, and uh, I just wonder, you know, we really need to, firstly, we need to get back to that, I think, in order to, to have a real strong sense of community. But beyond that, um, you know, how do we facilitate that kind of connection between education and the wider world? Because, you know, there's always this challenge of, um, you know, where, where did the big ideas come from? Is it, is it the, the, the fresh faced and, you know, wide eyed student who who is starting out and and um the world is their oyster or is it does it require seasoning and experience and is it in the workplace you know and uh, and, and maybe the answer is a little bit of both but 
Um, how do you see that? How do you see education in terms of preparing a designer for, for the real thing? Well, it, you know, I think as a student, it's almost good to live outside to a certain degree of the confines of the real world and then slowly um, build an independent eye or an independent voice that can then connect with the real world. I think in many curricula that I've seen, the real world is imposed too early on and students feel that they're trying to understand how to have a profession or how to make money. And that can really stifle innovation. But one of the real challenges of the moment that we're living in, which is long overdue, is the fact of how we even define community. Community can be a very exclusive term. And, you know, I don't even like the word inclusion because it sounds like there's a club and then you're letting people in. And that's a really wrong way to look at the current cultural phenomenon of change that we're experiencing. And so the, the very definition of community is a lot about listening and a lot, a bit, a lot of about um, unwinding the preconceptions that many of us have brought to our environment, whether it's school or work or wherever, so that community can be redefined by multiple voices and by a, a much clearer commitment to diversity of thought and diversity of demographic. Um, so the, the whole design world is really upending because of the fact that the principles of design were based on a model that is no longer relevant to the future. Um, and, and certainly that's happening in education as well. So I just wanted to make that one point about community. Um, I do think it's important to understand the needs of the real world, but in terms of the development of ideas, there is something so important about really looking at how curiosity in a student evolves um, a process that can lead to new new solutions or new opportunities or new questions. And um, a good education, I believe, is one where the principles that one learns can then be adapted to multiple circumstances, multiple environments, multiple um, realities. And, uh, and I see that a lot with individuals who are highly successful, who have come out of a design school education, that they're not doing exactly what they studied, but the principles of what they studied have informed something beyond even what they thought they might do in their professional lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to respond to that as well. I mean, the, back to the idea of inclusion, like two things that I want to talk, pick up on. One is the, this idea of education as a sort of cloistered environment, perhaps. Um, there's something um, I have to be careful with my choice of words. I don't want to say, well, I want to say personal. There's something very personal about the education experience. Um, you know, when there's so much emphasis on collaboration these days, there's this idea that um, the individual kind of gets lost in the, in the group and that's the right way to collaborate. Um, what, what I found is that the, the best collaborators are the ones who have a very strong point of view and they have a very strong um, um, capacity for a certain kind of work or a certain point of view. And when you start putting these people together, as you say, diversity of thought, then you get incredible results. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to develop that individual point of view, I think you're right, that kind of cloistered effect of early education where you teach a person to find themselves in a way, right? Because um, ultimately the designer only has themselves as a reference when you're exploring ideas and things are challenging and you, you know, you don't know if you like something or not, or, or, you know, when you really challenge yourself, you really have to look at yourself very deeply. Um, you know, I've found that in the most interesting design problems, you really are up against the wall. Mm -hmm. And so that yeah. idea of cloistering is really interesting because it, it, it's contrary to the idea of, of um, uh, this idea of working in groups and teams. And I think that's really healthy to actually cultivate that individuality as well as the ability to work together in, in, in students and, and, and professionals. Um, and um, 
there was another point and now I've forgotten it. <laughs> so I'll come back to you. It, I mean, the thing about teams is that the team is only as strong as um, the ability for every member of the team to participate and contribute. Yeah. And there are teams that are very hierarchical where uh, someone's ideas are not encouraged or where the judgment is so strong that the actual individual capacity of each person is not um, allowed to flourish. And there are other kinds of teams where that where there's where everyone is bringing something that's really important that will make the team much stronger there there are um, conflicting studies about collaboration and i've read them both ways one that says that collaboration weakens the the overall pool that it's the dominant voices that use the rest of the team to actually provide an outcome and then there are other studies that show that collaboration can be uh, uh, um, fountain of innovation when you get the team structured the right way and when there is enough expertise from different perspectives to actually better inform uh, a process that individuals are working on. So I, I, it really depends on how the collaboration is structured and what the expectations are and what the hierarchies are. And, um, and I, you know, from a, from a teaching perspective, I think we all know that we're learning certain things from a newer generation that are very different than what we may have experienced when we were their age. So there's kind of a flip about knowledge as well and what constitutes informed knowledge. But also, as you alluded to earlier, there is something really important about experience. And I think experience um, generates uh, learning because we've done something you know, more than once or, or we've had, the, you know, the, the, the real form of practice is that you do something again and again and you get better at it. And hopefully um, people with experience are getting better at what they're doing. But I think there's also something with experience in a team that knows something about the rhythm of movement within an idea that it's different when you've done it a lot of times that you understand that you're not just going to get to an outcome. You may have to go back and forth a lot. And you've seen that process work and you're not afraid of it. Whereas if you're less experienced with that, you might feel like you're getting lost earlier in the process. And that can be very daunting. I think also um, the experienced members in a team deal with judgment and failure differently because they've had more a lot more experience with knowing that failure is a opportunity to rethink how you come at an issue, not necessarily an end in itself. And um, so, so the, the balance of a team that has a lot of intuition about, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to design, of course, but the balance of a team where there is intuition from a generation that's really different and growing up in a world that they're going to face that's very different with individuals that have had the experience and the rhythm of experience can be a really fruitful combination. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, in our studio, we definitely benefit from that. And um, we, we have a kind of special way of collaborating where we, we, we kind of enter the room with a sort of beginner state of mind, right? We, we all agree that we're going to um, leave everything behind and start fresh and then um, make the project the primary subject and it's not each of us so it is kind of it's kind of egoless in a way but at the same time it's full of ego because everyone mm -hmm. has to contribute and work very hard so you got to mm -hmm. put everything into it. um you know the the other thing that you touched on is uh, the idea of inclusion and you know this it, obviously it's a very big important word right now inclusion and as you say it, it signifies um letting people into something um I, I always felt that design was didn't suffer from this kind of politics, and maybe I'm wrong about this because, for me, design was for humanity, uh, for you know every bit of humanity, young, old, uh, male, female, and otherwise, and every race. And uh, for me, you know, I, I always look at design as something like music. And and granted, we could all have different tastes in music, but. I feel that there's a, 
you know, an aspect of the, that kind of poetic resonance that happens in music, which which also happens in design. And so for me, I always thought, if we're designing well, our work should touch all people, <laughs> you know. And so when when suddenly there's talk in the community about being inclusive, I was a bit shocked. I thought, but aren't aren't we doing that already? I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, there are a lot of assumptions built into what it means to be humanitarian. And I agree with you in principle. I think that's what we all aspire to. But if you speak to people from marginalized communities, they don't necessarily feel part of the definition of what um, is, uh, you know, and I'm, we're gen I'm generalizing here, but they may not feel that that um, as well represented in the definition of, you know, one person's idea of humanity, humanity compared to another. And, you know, I'm just thinking of a concrete example, like in the healthcare system, if you actually look at the data, um, women of color in particular, if you look at just childbirth data or women's health issues around um, reproductive health, the, uh, the number of women who experience um, death in childbirth or who are given cesareans or um, who are just treated differently compared to women who are not of color is astounding. And so that says something about, and that's across the, you know, the US anyway, I'm not sure about in other countries, but that says something about the design of our healthcare system that it's, you know, I'm sure that the healthcare um, uh, administrators think that they are all about humanitarian causes, but when you look at the data of how people are experiencing those systems, it's not accurate. And I, I, I would venture that that's true in lots of different sectors, not just in healthcare. So, um, you know, the good news is this is a moment when new voices can help change that and that we can all work to make those changes. But I do think we have to look very carefully at the assumptions we've had in the past because they're only working for some populations, not all populations. And, you know, design is intended to be very humanitarian. So it's a time for design to step back and say, okay, let's hear from the voices of people who don't feel that they're getting the same, um, you know, the, the, that the design is resonating for them in their lives the way that we um, are, you know, may have expected it to resonate in the past. And, you know, part of that is just getting more diverse designers into the world. And, you know, I get calls um, as president of RISD frequently from companies saying, we're trying to have a more diverse design team in our company help us to find really talented designers. And there are a lot of internship plans that are evolving around the notion of diversifying teams and um, diversifying content. So it's happening, but, um, but I think we all need to acknowledge that we're not there yet, that we have a long way to go. It's, a, it's an interesting, I had a conversation with a Nigerian colleague of mine and um, what he was saying to me regarding diversity said, you and I have more in common than you and whoever. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was referring to our background, to education, to our point of view and things like that. And um, he referred to a book and I forgot the name of the book, but it was a, it was basically talking about diversity in a totally different way. It was talking about diversity of uh, point of view or diversity of thinking, which transcends all of the more visible barriers that or, or boundaries that we consider like like gender and race. Um, or sex and race, rather, and and uh, you know that 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 to me is a very interesting point of view because I think well you know people are trying because I I find very often if I'm in a situation which is uh, like a, a a business meeting um, regardless of who's in the room I'll probably have the most diverse point of view of any of them just because of my background and how I think um, so I. I think we have to be a little bit careful also about, you know, the idea of diversity because it, it doesn't necessarily cut across cleanly. Um, it doesn't, between no. Groups, um, you know, and I, 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 I've experienced that in many, in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, ultimately we have to evolve to be a society where we don't 
have to think about these things, but unfortunately right. now we do. Um, but and, and it's it really a lot of it's about justice issues of justice and yeah. and, um, and so and I think that strides are being made, um, but it will only in the design world it will only work if we take it very seriously and commit to yeah. it. Yeah, which I think the design world is beginning to do, and certainly education is doing. Yeah, yeah, certainly is. Um, you know, that, that kind of leads us to this idea of, of um, what the designer is capable of. You know, I, you know we, we talked about this a bit, this idea that you know, design is a kind of education that is more a way of thinking than it is a, a particular skill, perhaps. In other words, right? I mean, it, yes, you could be a designer of a certain type, whether it's graphic design or whether it's industrial design or architecture or anything else. Um, I would say a filmmaker is a kind of designer as well, <laughs> or at least a creative. And, and, and then, you know, the idea that that way of thinking can have so many uh, benefits to different aspects of life, you know, including business. And I think you had some other interesting examples as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think more, the more in line businesses are starting to put design at the sea level as you know it's called it's sort of top level because design used to be viewed um, as the thing at the end that would sort of make everything look good or communicate things or put you know style into something and now we're living in such a complex world and it's changing so so rapidly that uh, the the notion of design as a principle of um, creating the future or creating the conditions for something to manifest needs to be at the very core level of how something is conceived and more and more companies are in, are believing that and um, I, I might have quoted in an earlier conversation that we had that in 2010 IBM did a survey across I think 1200 CEOs around the globe in all different industries asking what was the um, top competency for success for a company in the 21st century. And the number one competency across the board was creativity. Mm -hmm. So the, this notion of, um, you know, design is a rigorous kind of education around creativity. It's taking creativity and then learning how to make outcomes from creativity. So the notion that, um, that designers should be at the conceptual frame, which is what designers are really good at, and then they're also really good at making outcomes, that what biz business wouldn't benefit from that? And um, the other thing that I think design is really good at is or orchestrating convening, the, the convening of thought, because when we design, we know how to take multiple inputs and, um, and make them into some kind of coherent outcome. And for a lot, a lot of people that weren't educated in in a sort of open-ended or circuitous route, are, are by nature much more linear thinkers, or they learned a body of knowledge that's necessary for them to carry out their work. Whereas design is about reinventing the body of knowledge all the time. So that form of thinking is so important for companies that are looking to be relevant or to change or to advance into the future. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since an architect has been president, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> a really long time. And, uh, yes. I think I Jefferson know. is the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, no, I know. Um, it, it, I think that, uh, the other thing that is important to recognize, and when I use the word convening, it's because part of the process, a good design process, is realizing where the capacities to grow knowledge are and where the capacities to ask for expertise are. Um, and, you know, I, I was reading the Airbnb story, which is, you know, the book about the formation of Airbnb, which you probably know was formed by two RISD grads um, who were designers. And so they had a very design approach to developing the company. And one of the interesting things in the book is how when they hit something, a knowledge area that they were not expert in, they knew how to seek out the expertise so that they were constantly learning you know, from people who had great um, wisdom to contribute. 
And you know, when I think about designers working to develop things that have never existed before, the sense of collaboration and, and how to solicit the knowledge that isn't inherent in the uh, individuals working together is, is something really important. Um, I, I said in an earlier conversation that we had that I really believe that innovation at the moment is most fertile in the uh, overlaps between bodies of knowledge and that innovation is often um, it, implicit there but that it sleeps and it takes the sense of people working very consciously together to bring their expertise together that then awakens the ideas that are sort of sleeping there to become innovative potential ideas. And I think designers are particularly good at those kind of convenings and at, and at bringing um, differing kinds of thinking and making and producing together uh, to an outcome. Mm. So yeah, hybrid kind of experience. Um, so I'm, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker as well. Mm -hmm. My background is architecture and I'm a writer. And, and, I, and I think you're absolutely right. That kind of toolkit that a designer develops is, is really quite healthy. And I mean, I, I mean, I, I almost feel like everybody should be a designer because they'd be happier. Do you, do you think that's true? I mean, well, I think every child should have design in their education and they yeah. would be happier. And, yeah. um, yeah. you know, you're a hybrid uh, practitioner and more and more people are. And when there was there was a study of scientists who received the Nobel Prize and then a comparable scientist who didn't. And they someone, you know, tried to identify what the difference was. And almost every almost to a fault, every single scientist that had won a Nobel Prize had a creative practice early in their lives, either music or some, or some form of the arts. And so there is something in the way that we formulate our experience of the world through the arts or through music or through um, design that uh, allows for a versatile kind of creative thinking that can be applied in, in all different areas. Um, so yes, I think everyone should, you know, uh, I, I don't want to ever de de demean the rigor of a design education because, you know, for years I've been asked um, by companies if we could do a workshop to teach design thinking as if it's, you know, yeah. there's a sandwich and the, the design thinking is kind of the mayonnaise that makes everything taste a little better. I mean, I'm not a big mayonnaise fan, but you know what I mean, the sauce. And, um, and I try and explain that we can do workshops to actually open up people to understand some design principles and practices, but design is a rigorous undertaking. And so, you know, that's why I say, I think for, if it was integrated into education from very early education onward, that we would be raising a much more enlightened and capable generation. But, uh, but I do want to emphasize the rigor that goes along with the design education, because it, um, you know, I think, when our students graduate after four or five or six or you know in the case of master students two or three years they're just beginning and um, and that's the point when they put their education together and often the best work that they do or the you know the, the newest work that has that has impact is a few years out of school because it takes so long to take all of that education and actually figure out how to apply it to something um, so it's, it's extremely rigorous and challenging and takes a long time and it's not the kind of thing that can be put into a workshop and then everybody leaves and they're a designer. Absolutely. And I can attest to that. Our, my thesis supervisor, who was also the Dean of the School of Architecture, Essi Banyasad, he told us uh, when it was day one of our masters that uh, he said, you have to think of the thesis as a quest and you mm -hmm. should f ask yourself a question that you can keep answering for the rest of your life. Nice. And I thought, yeah, that was really quite beautiful. Um, and, I, and I think I did hit on that question. I'm still trying to answer that question. So it's yeah. true. And, and it, it's true that you keep learning. And um, that, that is probably the most important part about being a designer. I mean, this is always the challenge really between practice and, and growth as a designer, because you, as a professional, you're expected to perform successfully every time you can take risks you know the client is paying for something to succeed and uh and so you're on this uh, 
knife edge between innovation and certainty all the time. That's right. And it, it's, it's quite exciting. Um, and, you know, it's completely invisible because this battle is playing out in your mind. And, uh, but yet, you know, this is what, what, uh, what we go through all the time. So it's uh, That's right. And, and that, I think another way to look at it is um, I, I like the notion of a quest. That's a really nice concept. I have often said to students that it's kind of like a relationship that you have to care for. And, you know, your, your own relationship with your practice is one of the most important relationships you'll ever have in your life. And in some cases, for many people, the longest lasting relationship um, you know, and I still have sketchbooks that I um, made when I was in my second year of design school. And there's so much in there that I interpret differently now because my relationship with my work has grown, but the, 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 the seeds were there from the very beginning. Um, mm. So I think looking at your own personal practice as a relationship that takes the same care and nurturing and attention and um, in, you know, new forms of creating intuition by inspiring yourself with new experiences and new um, inputs all the time uh, is a, a, also, I think, a nice way to look at a design practice because then that sort of care that goes into it grows. And then after, you know, a number of years, you can sort of look back and see how you've built the relationship with the same care that you would with a a person that you care a lot about. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's that's a nice segue into this idea of designing your life, which is what mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were talking about. And yeah, I'd like to hear more about that. What do you think about the way we design our lives? I mean, it's um, it's you know the I I mean I'm I'm always kind of going on about what's wrong with the world, but also what's right with the world because there's and I and I think this you know this idea of blessed unrest you know martha graham when she talks about this thing about being a creative you're never satisfied you're always hungry for change and to make something better mm -hmm. um and and so that you know it's it's a beautiful life but at the same time it's it's it's, it's a challenging life mm -hmm. but then how do you apply that to designing your life so that you make it better all the time yeah well it's the biggest creative process that anyone has to understand to go and you know again um, having the ability to design your life is really a ter tremendous privilege um, but so so it should be taken very seriously and and um, and approached uh, with a lot of intention and you know in in a school situation when we're creating a strategic plan or we're thinking about making big change in an institution, you know, and institutions don't turn on a dime. They're very complicated to change. Mm -hmm. And the same is true in many businesses. It's very difficult to make change quickly. Um, the, the notion of um, looking at the, the, uh, the ability to make change, I think, really is aided by understanding a kind of value statement. And it, it's an interesting exercise for individuals to do that for themselves, to say, I'm going to actually write down my values and I'm going to say, what are the key values? And I'm going to use these as guiding principles for how I design my life. And I'm going to refer to them and they're going to change as I change too. Uh, but it's so interesting to actually, I mean, we've done it for, for the institution, but it's really interesting if you look at those same principles and say, how do those define me and what I'm trying to do? And, you know, there, uh, I mean, I lived through the eighties when, um, really the thing was making money and being a star, right? And that became old very fast. I mean, everyone has to face the reality of, of uh, supporting their families or themselves or their, you know, their friends or loved ones. But the notion of the kind of stardom thing is, has really dwindled, certainly among the current group of students who care a lot less about being a famous designer than they do about making impact in the world. And that comes from a change in values that this experience, that this generation is experiencing. And, and on the one hand, people talk about this generation, you know, from a shallow perspective in terms of a lot of the social media stuff, which can be very um, superficial. But on the other hand, it's a generation that's full of deep seated values that, that are evolving and 
feel the need um, that is cast upon us by some of the big challenges across the globe, you know, justice issues, inequity, climate justice, all the things that this generation cares so much about. And, you know, I think it's an interesting um, exercise for all of us to go through and say, what would my value statement look like? And then look at how that is actually being translated or lived out through the practice that we take on. Yeah. You know, that's, that's beautiful. Now, I have two teenage daughters and plus one more te- younger daughter, but they're always telling me about, um, you know, the real world that we're in and, and what's wrong with it. And so it's a, a good, healthy, constant reminder <laughs> to yes. keep my point of view open and fresh. And, yes. and I think that's, yeah, part of being a designer, as you say, and, um, and uh, adapting to changing values. Um, I don't know. I think we talked about quite a few good things today. Is there something that you think we might finish off with or should we cap it? Sure. Well, I would just say one other thing, I think, which is um, that I, I always um, have loved the notion of design as uh, the ultimate form of optimism, you know, yeah. that um, one can, I mean, take examples through history where there was design that was terribly um, dark and um, uh, anti-humanitarian, but that everyone has the option as a designer to think about the fact that the future isn't just going to happen, that it's going to be made, and that if we want to see ourselves as individuals that are contributing to the future that we want to see, we can look at the imperative of bringing enormous optimism into how we approach that. And I think design and designers are uniquely positioned to be the kind of ultimate optimists um, for the larger populations. Yeah, absolutely. And we need that more than ever now. I think this, you know the past kind of year and a half has challenged a lot of people, right? And absolutely. We got, you know, so much is um, has not gone to plan, and uh, uh, a sense of mistrust of institutions, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, people not wanting to take the vaccine. And I mean, it has so many sort of uh, the roots of fear have have taken hold of a lot of people in different ways. Um, You're absolutely, absolutely spot on. I mean, it's the idea that you have to believe in in success or you have to believe in something good happening in order for it to happen. And so um, otherwise you give up. Right. Um, So if we believe in a good future, we'll we'll make it happen. So. I hope everyone can uh, take that away at least. That's a good way to finish. Thank you very much, Rosanne. Thank you so much. A pleasure talking with you. Absolutely lovely talking to you. Be well. Bye-bye.